بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وعلى من استنى بسنته واقتفى أثره إلى يوم الدين Welcome to the Friday حلقة And uh, we are still uh, taking uh, a thematic uh, approach to the Quran So we are making some sort of a brief commentary and we have reached Surah Yusuf, which is Surah number 12 in the Quran. And uh, SubhanAllah, this is one of the surahs as well that are named after a prophet, which is Prophet Yusuf, Joseph, peace be upon him. And it falls in the general category where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala shares the stories of previous prophets and messengers with, with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in order to uh, serve as a moral support and also to put his uh, the challenges that he was dealing with to put them in perspective uh, surah uh, the story of prophet yusuf alayhi salam is unique in a sense that it is um, uh, it's the whole surah is about the life of yusuf alayhi salam pretty much anything else is just a sh very short introduction and then a conclusion towards the end, which is almost one page. Uh, so, but but the the surah the surah has one theme, one topic, and that's the story of Prophet Yusuf, alayhi salam. And um, so, the surah is all about a story, and the moral of the story. And we are going to see, inshallah, how. Subhanallah, the moral of the story is, is uh, again, this is an advice to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, an advice to all believers. <clears throat> there, there will be uh, a common theme repeating itself through the surah. And one of them, uh, and, and one of those instances when Yusuf Alayhi Salaam says, إِنَّهُ مَنْ يَتَّقِ وَيَصْبِرْ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُضِيعُ أَجَرَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Indeed, uh, for those who... Uh, have taqwa, adhere to taqwa, so they are mindful, they are aware of Allah, and thus they behave accordingly, and they are patient, and they persevere. So these two things, taqwa and sabr, they, they run through the surah, and they, they, they are actually, Yusuf is stating that this is the reason for why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes things work for him. Although if you look at the apparent events in the, in the story of Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam, it seems to be like a disaster after the other. Um, so inshallah, we're going, we're going to, to get into them. So let's look at the beginning of the surah. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the same style as the previous surahs. Allah starts with alif lam ra, tilka ayatul kitab al mubin. These are the uh, verses of a book that is clear, or that clarifies the truth. The truth. So two meanings. It's a clear book, and it also clarifies the truth. We have sent down the Quran in Arabic. It's an Arabic book, so that you may comprehend, you may understand it. Somebody might think, you know, since uh, it's 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 a book in Arabic. So what about people who speak another language or a different language? Does that apply to them? Well, let's 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 first address the Arabs. So the the Quran is speaks their language, and it was the pinnacle. This was that time was the pinnacle of the Arabic language, in terms of eloquence and in terms of semantics, depth and mastery. So the Quran surpassed that level of language. Obviously, it's a, it's the divine word. And it conveyed the message in the most profound and powerful way. So, in, so it was su such a profound message to the Arabs, specifically at that time. And it's a profound message to the world. So why does Allah say that Allah revealed it, that he revealed it in Arabic so that you may understand? Because the language of the Arabic language is the only language that is going to survive that is going to survive. And we see that the Arabic language still survives until now, 1400, 1400 years later. And any Arab speaker, an av average Arab speaker, who's like the average educated Arab speaker, when they read the Quran, they understand, you know, 
quite a bit of the Quran. They understand more than 50%. And if we talk about the, 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 the main meaning, they understand way above 50%. So the, the, actually the message of the Quran is clear to the even average Arabic speaker. And I'm not talking here about highly educated people or sophisticated and learned people. Uh, so the Arabic language is preserved. And it's going to be preserved. And Allah in his infinite knowledge, in his foreknowledge of everything, obviously knew that the Arabic language was going to survive and he was going to make it survive. So he revealed the Quran in this language and the Arabic language, especially in its uh, height, like in it, the best in, in the best time of, of its history, uh, uh, possessed such profound ways of expression in syntax and semantics in grammar and everything. And thus it was a very good frame or a very good, let's say container for the meanings of the Quran. So it, it, it displayed so much potential and so much uh, like depth in it that it was the best, obviously the best language for divine revelation, the final revelation that was going to remain with humanity to be revealed in. So these are factors that obviously made the Arabic language uh, the language of the, to be the language of the of the Quran. So in this sense, yes, since the Arabic language is going to survive, is going to be preserved, and is going to maintain most of its depth, so the message of the Quran will remain with it, and it can always be translated. It can always be interpreted to speakers of other languages. And also, there's an element that some scholars of Tafsir, of Tafsir spoke about. They said the people will speak the Arabic language, not necessarily the Arabs as an, as an ethnicity, but the people who will speak the Arab, Arabic language, the Arabs and the non-Arabs, they will eventually be the best be people to be the translators or the carriers of the message of the Quran to humanity, not only in words and translation, but also in their way of life in their demeanor in the way they approach life in the way they deal with with this world yes this doesn't speak about everyone and it doesn't necessarily speak about the majority because especially at times of of decline but generally speaking this is going to be uh, compared to any other language this is something that is special with the arabic language so, so these things were highlighted as to why the Quran was revealed in Arabic and why being revealed in Arabic is the best way to convey it to people. Again, within human parameters. Then Allah SWT addresses the Prophet Muhammad SAW directly and he says, That we narrate to you the best of stories. And this made some of the scholars say that the story of Prophet Yusuf is the best story. And, and it is, it, indeed, it is profound. It is a very powerful, deep story. And it's full of lessons. And there are, like, there, there are scholars who actually wrote uh, exclusively on Surah Yusuf, on the benefits of Surah Yusuf. So it's rich with benefits and, and, and uh, lessons. So, so, so this is one reason it is called the best of the uh, best of stories and some scholars say in Ahsan al qasasi it doesn't necessarily refer to the story of prophet yusuf, yusuf islam, but it refers in general to the stories that are in the quran all of them are the best stories because they are from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they have the best content and lessons and benefits and before that, you were from those who were not conscious and aware, meaning you did not have knowledge about Allah, proper knowledge about Allah. You didn't have, you didn't have the knowledge that was revealed in the Quran. So compared to the state that you reached after the revelation of the Quran, you were before not among those who were aware and conscious and connected and informed. So thus, the Quran has this uh, knowledge that, that awakened you, that opened your eyes to the reality. Uh, of of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the reality of this world and how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And here in verse number number four, this surah starts. And remember, or just it's a way to start the story when Yusuf said to his father, Dad, I saw 11 planets and the sun and the moon prostrating before me, prostrating in my direction. And now the father of Prophet Yusuf is Prophet Ya'qub. It's Prophet Ya'qub, Jacob. Um, so Yusuf is called by Prophet Muhammad He said he's Al-Kareem, Ibn Al-Kareem, Ibn Al-Kareem. He's the, the honored, son of the honored, son of the honored. Because he's Yusuf, son of Ya'qub, Jacob, son of Ishaq, Ibn al-Karim as well, also the son of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a genera generations of dignified, honored prophets and uh, messengers. So Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam is from Bani Israel because Bani Israel are the children of uh, Prophet Ishaq alayhi, uh, or Prophet Yaqub alayhi salam. Prophet Yaqub alayhi salam he is called Israel. He's called Israel. So Bani Israel are the children of Yaqub. So he's from Bani Israel. Um, yeah, so his father was a prophet and he was a wise man. And he understood the intent or the interpretation of the, of the dream. And this shows that dreams, as the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, um, the the Prophet ﷺ classified dreams or visions that people see in their sleep into three categories. Some of them, ru'ya haq, a true vision. And this is something that has to do with the spiritual nature of humans. So it's some kind of knowledge, or inspiration, or some kind of vision that the soul sees. And it's true. That's where the true vision comes from. Ru'ya. It's called ru'ya in the Arabic language. Ru'ya haq. Uh, the second type, the Prophet ﷺ said, hadith nafs It's basically your thinking. Your mind is thinking. Something, you saw something, or you went through uh, a situation, there was an, an accident or an incident, or, or, or you're, you're, you're thinking about something. Your mind keeps thinking about it, and you might see some images in your sleep that are related to this. Or even your mind might, might make up a story from the elements that you saw or you were thinking about. So it might synthesize, your mind, your mind might synthesize a story from these. The third type the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, and he said, Mina shaytan, it is from shaytan. Shaytan whispers some meanings, some thoughts, and you get to see them or visualize them in your sleep. So these are the three types of experiences in the sleep or three types of visions or dreams in our sleep. So, and there are signs to recognize the true vision so, uh, so Prophet Yaqub recognized this was a true vision and he realized what it meant basically that Yusuf was going to become a prophet. And obviously the, and he's going to have power and dominance and position, high position. Thus the prostration is a symbol of, uh, because he, he was prostrated to a symbol of glory and status. So the 11, um, uh, the 11 planets were symbols or refer to his brothers because he had 11 brothers and the sun and the moon it seems that it refers to his father and his mother and this is going to become true towards the end of the story as we are going to see so the father said to his son he said oh my son did not relate your story to your brothers, lest they plot against you. They develop some envy uh, towards you, and then they plot against you, and they plan something. Because shaitan is indeed a sworn enemy to humans. And so he realized the intensity of the story, and that the, his sons could potentially understand that it means there's something special about Yusuf alayhi salam. 
And it also shows the weakness. These are the sons of a prophet or a, of a messenger, one of the greatest messengers, Prophet Yaqub, salam, Jacob. Um, but again, it shows that Yaqub was aware of the impact of shaitan and that shaitan actually plays a role in the relationships between siblings, brothers and sisters. He brings about hatred, envy, comparison. So, uh, so he recognizes this weakness in humans, in his, in his own children, and he warns his son. He says, don't relate that story to them. Don't relate the story of your dream to them. And we know Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu told us in a hadith, استعينوا, استعينوا You know, seek success in your affairs by keeping them to yourself. Keep, you know, low key. Do things low key. You know, you don't have to publicize everything you do. You don't have to publicize your intentions. Unless, you know, you can inform people who you trust really want good for you. And people who you might need, you know, you might need their support, their help. So they, so you will inform them of what you are up to so that you, it makes sense when you ask them for help. So shaitan indeed is an enemy. And this shows the weakness of, of humans and that shaitan, you know, can exercise some influence in them, can, can actually capitalize on their weakness. وكذلك يشتبك ربك ويعلمك من تأويل الحديث ويتم نعمته عليك وعلى آل يعقوب كما أتم الآية to the rest of the verse so he says to his son and your lord is going to favor you is going to give you something special by teaching you the meanings of speech the meanings here a hadith تأويل الحديث it seems uh, the meanings of divine words and also the meanings of dream interpretations and Allah would perfect his favor upon you and upon the family of Yaqub of Jacob just as he completed it and perfected it on uh, Ibrahim and Ishaq before inna rabbaka hakimun alim indeed your lord is all knowing and all wise then Allah speaks generally about the story of Prophet Yusuf saying لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي يُوسُفَ وَإِخْوَتِهِ آيَاتٌ لِلسَّائِدِينَ Indeed there is in, the, in Yusuf and his brothers there are lessons for those who are asking. Now Allah starts narrating the story. So the story starts with the brothers of Yusuf and they were so Prophet Yaqub had more than one wife and these brothers, this group of brothers that, that are referred to in the story, were from another mother. So their mother was not the same mother of Yusuf alayhi salam. Yusuf and his brother Benjamin or Benjamin. So these brothers, they noticed that Yusuf alayhi salam was very special and his father had something special for him. Although we know as a prophet, Jacob, Jacob must have treated his children as fairly as he could. But yet sometimes, you know, you don't, you, you know, especially with siblings and when there is competition, they get to see the slightest, even if there's a very natural, impossible to control kind of liking towards one of your children, the others will notice this. So probably that's what they picked up on. And they said, you know, Yusuf and his, his brother are, dearer to our father than us you know our our dad is must must be sort of like must be in some kind of misguidance you know he's is must be out of his mind why is this happening so the jealousy and we know shaitan blew into this it grew bigger and bigger and bigger until they reached a point where they decided to get rid of their views of because they thought he's the one who's standing uh, in the way of the love of our father and so if Yusuf, for them, if Yusuf disappears, then our father is going to give us so much attention and love. Uh, so they decided, you know, again, that's envy. Uh, they decide, and this shows you that humans have this, have these evil tendencies, everyone. And unless people work on themselves, you know, they, they will always have this proclivity to evil. And this is why you can't feel safe about your human nature. And many people who think good of themselves, they are actually good because they've never been truly tested. 
and and uh, and, and this is why sometimes you know in, in difficult times especially when crime becomes easy when when, when committing atro atrocities comes to a doorstep uh, pretty you know much decent people commit atrocious acts and this is something that is very well documented in Nazi Germany so the 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 the, the guards in the concentration camps the ones who were committing crimes who were torturing humans innocent humans uh, they're documented to have been average people average human beings and even after the war was was over world war ii a lot of these people went to their normal life and they led pretty much a decent life but this chapter of their life was always filled with again like uh, pain and agony and and it was the dark side the dark side of their humanity. And this is something that is referred to by, for example, by some psychologists like uh, Carl Jung referred to that as the shadow. That, so there's a dark side to humans and this is the dark side of the, of, of the nefs, of the self, the human self and the ego. And, on, and, and no one should feel safe about that. And, and if someone seems to be very good, again, it, it might be, their goodness might be, because they have not been tested. They have not been put on this spot where there was a great temptation or there was a lot of pressure to commit something evil. So, again, these are the brothers of Yusuf, and it seems that envy and jealousy really, like, reached a level of, it developed a lot of momentum to where it reached a level where they considered that it was fair, it was a fair game to get rid of Yusuf, to that extent. So they said, let's just throw him somewhere, you know, send him to another land, or kill him, and then your father would, you know, have no one but you in front of him, and he, his love would flow to you because Yusuf supposedly is blocking it. Then after that, you become good people. And again, that's another, another dark side of humans, because we always, you know, one of the reasons humans commit atrocities is that they, they say, I'll repent later on. I'll fix things later on. I'll just do, I'll just do this one bad thing. Then, you know, I will, I will do the, I will, I will you know, transform into a good person. Uh, but again, this is from, you know, shaitan playing around with people. One of them who was apparently the wisest, the, the least evil in that sense, uh, one of them said, um, and it seems some of the Mufassirin said, this is going to be named later on as Al-Bashir, because he was the most reasonable among them. He said, don't kill Yusuf. Like, this is such a huge crime. Why do you kill him? Do something less evil. And you guys can throw him in a, in a, in a, in a pit or a wall uh, or, or a well. And, you know, somebody some travelers would pick him up and they would take him and he would be gone forever but we don't need to kill him right he said if you insist insist you want you want to do something you want to get rid of him at least don't kill him just you know go with something less than that so they tried to convince the father to take yusuf on a, on a picnic or a trip on a, a, he wasn't feeling comfortable about that, but they insisted, and under their ins uh, 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 under their insistence, he gave in. So they took Yusuf, and they promised they're going to, you know, uh, offer him good time so he can play and have fun. Uh, but then, eventually, what they did, they left Yusuf in a deserted well, and um, they took his shirt, they ripped it apart. And they slaughtered sh sheep, and they 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 uh, they soaked the shirt, Yusuf's shirt, in the blood of the sheep, just to convince the father because they made up a story already that we were racing, we went racing, and we left Yusuf with our luggage, and then when he came back, he had been eaten by. We found out he had been eaten by a, a wolf or some beast. Um, yeah, so they left him in the in the well, and they came back to their father, pretending to be cry, to be crying, to be weeping, and be sad. And they said, you know, we we went uh, uh, racing. We left Yusuf. He was eaten by the wolf, 
And you're probably not going to believe believe what we say. And again, that's a way of, again, when a liar, a liar tries to go overboard, try to convince you. Uh, and they always give clues, right, of their uh, of their lies. So they said, and you're probably not going to believe, you know, what we're saying, even though we are telling the truth. But their father said, you know, no, you guys, you know, put together a plan. You got guys conspired. And I don't know what that is, but I'm just gonna, I'm going to have beautiful patience. I'm going to be patient. It's, it's such a huge calamity to lose his son in this way. And by who? By his other sons. And then he seeks Allah's help. He says, Wallahu musta'anu ala ma And I seek Allah's help against what you were saying because what you're saying is not true. And you're hiding the truth and I seek Allah's help. I'm gonna hold on to patience. This is a predicament Allah put me in. I'm going to be patient. That's how I'm going to deal with it. And here we come across the first tool to handle life that we're taking from Prophet Yusuf, the story of Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam. There is no guarantee that life will not hit you hard. But when it hits, Allah provided. Allah did not leave us without you know, tools to handle it. So one of the most profound tools that Allah gave us is patience. And patience means that there is pain, there is discomfort. Um, and instead of, instead of acting on impulse and instead of giving in, you're going to transcend this situation and you're going to bite your tongue or put up with your pain and uh, not allow it to control you, not allow it to dictate your response. Rather, you're going to transcend it. So your response will not be triggered by the pain or the discomfort of the situation. So this is one of the most powerful tools with which we can handle and deal with the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because this patience is actually part of al-qadr. It's a tool. It's, it's one of the part of the toolkit that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us to handle and to be able to deal with al-qadr. So with the painful, with the unpleasant, with the uncomfortable, uh, what we have is patience. And he said, Wallahu al I seek Allah's help. This is tawakkul. This is tawakkul. So he's having patience and he's having tawakkul. Then the shift goes to Yusuf alayhi salam. Allah says, وَجَاءَتْ سِيَّارَةٌ فَأَرْسَلُوا وَارِدَهُمْ فَأَدْلَى دَلْوَهُ قَالَ يَا بُشْرَى هَذَا غُلَامٌ وَأَسَرُّهُ بِضَاعَةٌ وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ بِمَا يَعْمَلُونَ وَشَرَوْهُ بِثَمَنٍ بَخْسٍ دَرَاهِمِ مَعْدُودَةٍ وَكَانُوا فِيهِ مِنَ الزَّاهِدِينَ So Allah says, and a caravan came by, by the well where Yusuf had been left. And they said, send someone to they because they know usually these caravans they know the, the 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 trade route they know it and they know what facilities there are and they they recognize there's a well there so they send someone to go and get them some water they send this person he goes and he comes back and he says hey good news there's a little boy over there and obviously little boy deserted in a well what is that it's a financial, you know, benefit. You take this boy, sell him, because slavery was very common at the time. You take this boy, sell him in the slave in the slave market, and you make some free money. So that was it. So he said, "Ya Bushra hada ulam wa asaruhu bidaa," and and they secretly took him as a commodity, as an object. And again, it probably shows that. This was the ones who were running the caravan, the operators of the caravan, not everyone. And they hid him. Why? Because there would be repercussions. There might have been wise people, decent people in their caravan who would say, no, this, this child must belong to somebody here in the locality. You can't stake him. So they knew what they were doing was wrong. So they took him. They took him. And this was happening in Palestine. So the caravan was heading to Egypt. So when they arrived in Egypt, they sold him. And they didn't sell him for much. They didn't sell him 
for much. Verse number 20. They sold him for a, a really cheap you know, price. Um, and they probably they were just happy to get a few, you know, uh, a few quid and just, you know, not 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 have, you know, just trade him safely, basically, without uh, bringing any trouble, putting, putting themselves in trouble. So the one who bought him, interestingly, was one of the most influential people in Egypt. And and uh, it's called, he's called Al-Aziz. It's called Al-Aziz, yes. So Al-Aziz is more like a minister, a secretary, a very influential person uh, in, in the government of Egypt. So he bought him, he brought him to the house and he said to his wife, Akrimi Mathwahu, take care of this boy. Obviously, he noticed he was special. There was something special. And we're going to see in the story of Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam, there's always something special about him. And this is something that is obviously special about him because of his, his handsome. We know the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam said that he was given half of handsomeness or beauty um, that Allah gave to humans. But again, it's not only that, but also there is, uh, as I believe, was it Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu? He said, Inna lil hasanati yudiyya an fil wajhi. Nuran fil qalbi wudiyya an fil wajhi. For hasana, for every good deed that you do, there is light in your heart. It brings about light in your heart and beauty on the face. So, radiance. So, there is something about Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam that everyone saw him sort of, you know, noticed something special about him. So he said to his wife, Al-Aziz, he said to his wife, take care of him, uh, treat him well uh, so that we could benefit from him. Or maybe we could even take him as a boy, as our own son, like adopt him as our own son. Uh, Allah says, وَكَذَلِكَ مَكَّنَّا لِيُوسُفَ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلِنُعَلِّمَهُ مِنْ تَأْوِيلِ الْأَحَادِيثِ وَاللَّهُ غَالِبٌ عَلَىٰ أَمْرِهِ وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ A beautiful statement here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, and thus we have established Yusuf. Facility, like we have made circumstances where, where in his where he's living, his medium, his environment, helpful and conducive. So you made him established. There's some sort of settlement. He's settled. Uh, it's not like a life of trouble and uh, a disturbance all the time. No, there is some kind of stability in that life. And, and this is how, generally speaking, you get pe people get to advance, establish something and build something. Because usually when life is very uh, turbulent, it's very hard to build like knowledge or to build, uh, to build something. The, the, the person, because things are not stable, so the pe people don't build you know, something over time, like habits, uh, knowledge, trade, craft, etc. So, and this shows that in life, we need some stability. We need, th there, is, there is a level of necessary stability for people to grow, to learn, to establish something, to be even psychologically, uh, you know, sound. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we have made this available for, to Yusuf alayhi salam, and thus we, so that we teach him, again, so Allah teaches him, the meanings, the true meanings, the meanings of revelation, etc., and also wisdom in general. And Allah has power to make his word come true. Allah has a, has a plan there. Allah has a plan here. And Allah says, whatever he wrote, whatever he decided, that's, that's what's going to happen in ways we never expect. But most people don't. No, first number 22. And when he reached puberty, when he reached like an age where he's strong, when he's a strong man now, we gave him wisdom and knowledge, and we also give him strength. We also give him, gave him this hukum here is more about some personal power. Um, personal discipline, some strong presence, so, something about him there that is that makes him a, 
has possess some power, some influence. Hukman wa ilma. Or it could be judgment here, hukum. It could be judgment, very sound judgment and good character. And this is how we pay back. And this is how we recompense those who do well, those who always do the right thing. And this is another tool to deal with qadr, that when you do the best, when you don't wrong others, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's what he gives. He gives wisdom, knowledge, sound judgment, and he also gives power. Okay, I think it's enough for today, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, because we're going to start with uh, a very important part of his of the story of Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam. And we're going to leave that till next week. So, uh, again, so just to conclude, we are dealing with Surah Yusuf alayhi salam. It's Surah Makkiya, by the way, was revealed in, it was revealed in, uh, in Mecca, or before the Hijrah, or we'd say, before the Hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And uh, we saw that it, it was uh, an important part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala consoling Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, giving him more reassurance uh, and putting his, the struggles he was going through, putting that in context. So inshallah, we're going to see you next Friday or meet you next Friday. ta'ala. hope you guys are keeping safe and uh, hope you are utilizing uh, this time and making good use of it. Until then. Uh, I leave you in peace. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.